welcome to the end of the quarter, you guys. Uh, hopefully we're excited about almost being there. I am for sure. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed the speakers we've brought in this quarter. Um, I was joking with Anson that uh, that I, I call it Dr. Watkins 40 under 40 uh, for the most part. <laughs> Um, and he was honored that he was included among this crew. So I've known Anson for a long time. I don't even remember anymore how our paths crossed the first time. Uh, yeah. but, but transit technology geeks is the, the, top, the area we both put ourselves into. Um, Anson did his MS and his PhD at MIT and stays connected to them, although his roots are here in California, so maybe we will figure out a way to pull him to the better coast. Um, <laughs> but he continues to be associated with MIT as the, what is the official title, the deputy director of their transit lab there. So he does things at MIT, similar to what Susie and I are trying to do here at Davis. Um, and he is also the project lead for analysis and research at a firm called, called firm called Conveil, who many of you have maybe heard about some of their products, and I think part of this talk is going to talk about some of those. So join me in welcoming Anson. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just echo, I hope you've enjoyed all of the speakers this quarter, because uh, you probably won't enjoy this one. This one, I know a high bar has been set. I'll do my best, um, but hopefully I, I don't disappoint too much. So I'm going to talk this afternoon a little bit about computing new dimensions for use in multimodal access metrics. Um, and I'll talk about this both tying in some research that I've done and helped advise with a number of students at MIT, and also some uh, open source software that we work with at Mail. Uh, so first off, multimodal access metrics. Uh, I think at the end of last quarter, you heard from Henry and colleague from Caltrans about how Caltrans is adopting multimodal access metrics. Um, so I'm going to touch briefly on that, on the growing adoption of these metrics, and also walk through what I think is the state of practice being adopted. Then I will get into some dimensions beyond the basic travel times used in, uh, in kind of the state of the practice access metrics. Uh, in each of these sections, talking about cycling comfort and safety, the, uh, some transit analyses and also fair costs and monetary constraints. I'll have some ideas for future research in each of those sections and each of those kind of other dimensions. Then I'll conclude with some ideas for next steps on how we can measure what really matters to, to travelers. So first off, multimodal access. Uh, I want to start with a quote from Professor Handy, uh, who's been an inspiration for me for many years, uh, going back to my early graduate work. Um, a couple of years ago, three years ago now, came out with an article saying transportation planning seems to be on the cusp of an accessibility era. This has been, and by accessibility, we mean metrics here like the number of jobs reachable within 45 minutes, uh, biking or driving or taking trains. Maybe on the cusp of this era, what's what's driving the adoption of accessibility metrics? Well, these access metrics have been promoted in academic research for decades, uh, but we're actually seeing real adoption now uh, in places like Caltrans, in places like SACOG, uh, a number of states across the U.S. The federal government has really been emphasizing it. I'll touch on that briefly in, uh, at the end of the presentation, and also around the world, uh, we, we've really seen this take off. Driving the adoption, failures of the kind of traditional mobility focused approach, budget constraints, climate change. So those are driving adoption. What's enabling this adoption? I think a number of things are enabling this adoption. Uh, I pulled out this quote from a report by Eric Sundquist uh, before he came to Caltrans, Chris McHale and Michael Brennis. Uh, this has been fueled by improved data and computing power. Uh, at this time, at the time this report came out, there were at least two commercial providers offering platforms for accessibility analysis. Even as these become enabled by computing platforms, it's still a challenge to figure out the right metrics. Um, so I'm going to talk on kind of computing and open source software as key enablers. There are also many other things. Figuring out how to actually embed these in the decision making process is I think still an open question 
Uh, actually, tonight I'm going to Indianapolis for a conference TRB is putting together. Uh, Henry's going to be participating in that as well. And we're going to be asking practitioners this question how do we actually formulate and write metrics to embed in decision making? So that's still an open research question. Um, but today I'm going to focus a little bit more on kind of the first parts there the computing and the open source stuff. So, what are some of these computation methods? Uh, traditional ones have been built on top of kind of traditional travel demand modeling software. Uh, Cube Access is one from a few years ago. PTV, the German software modeling firm, just came out with a special package they call PTV Access. Has anyone seen the transit sketch planning platform Remix? Show of hands, a few people. So, Remix is a software platform used for transit planning. They rolled out something this year called Network Jane, which is basically uh, accessibility metrics, access and opportunity metrics. Open Trip Planner has historically been a key one used by a number of agencies that's open source. And the one I'm most familiar with is R5, uh, open source software by Conveil. It's really niche and focused on transit and multimodal routing. So it tries to capture some of those details that really matter to people who aren't using cars. Whereas some of the, especially the first two, might be a little bit more focused on kind of traditional car based travel demand modeling. Uh, it's open source, as I mentioned, and has also been extended by independent parties uh, to, it, by independent parties to make their own additional open source libraries. So if you prefer using R, there's R5R available. If you prefer using Python, there's R5Pi available. Uh, and it's really kind of this. I think one enabler has been this kind of open source approach and sharing the innovation. If you're interested, uh, Rafa, there's been a, a great project done in Brazil to calculate detailed multimodal access metrics for every city in Brazil. Uh, that's work that's been led by the Brazilian National Statistics Economic Agency, IKEA. Uh, Rafael Pereira and Dan Harrison are uh, two of the leaders of that. They put out a great ebook. Uh, can send these slides around, I guess, so you'll have the link. Um, but this ebook is all about how to calculate these metrics using open source software like R5. Uh, so definitely this kind of wide availability of these tools has been driving this. We've also seen access measures being featured in public engagement. Here's a screenshot of, shot of a tool LA Metro put out for their next gen bus network plan. And you can see here, you could move this pin around and see how far you could get within certain time bands, right? So here you can see 10 minutes in red all the way up to 60 minutes in purple. How far you could get from that specific origin in downtown LA. So these are isochrons, but they also show what is within those different time bands, right? So if you want to see what's within a 10 minute trip of that band, They'll show you how many hotels are available in the current network under the post, how many arts, entertainment, recreation destinations, how many retail destinations, how many population, uh, how many employees. So these, these are what I mean by access metrics, right? Saying here's a certain distance we can travel, here's a certain area we can cover in a certain amount of time. What's within that area? Access to hotels, entertainment, retail jobs, population, employees, et cetera. And this is featured in one of their kind of public engagement portals, right? Same thing with um, Jarrett Walker, the well-known transit consultant. He's been really promoting this idea of access and um, uses open trip planner to calculate these same types of network indicators in all sorts of places. I think this was an example from Miami. And you can see here with their proposed network showing uh, with this network concept from that specific origin, you could get to 40% more jobs and 45% more residents with the new network. So these, these are in kind of being featured in the public materials for these types of projects. Let me talk now a little bit more about what I see as the state of the practice uh, with uh, the tool built on R5 that Bill puts out. Um, so here's an example in Chicago. Uh, and we can see here, let me see if we can get this to play. Um, you can see how far someone could get within that time band, right? So as we move that slider up, the blue area shows the, the area they could cover all the way up to two hours from this specific origin. And then you can see what it would look like back down at an hour. And this is multimodal, right? So this is walking, taking transit, and then walking again. 
departing in a specific time band, so say from 7.30 to 8.30 a.m. Um, and you can also adjust what we call the travel time percentile. So depending on when you leave, you might just make the bus, you might just miss the bus. There is variability in your experience. And we capture that variability by looking at the full distribution of travel times. In this case, from this origin in blue to the destination shown in the black circle, it would take between 60 and 90 minutes, depending on whether you just make the bus or just miss the bus. And the median travel time for trips starting in that morning rush hour window would be about 80 minutes. So we can then say what's within this uh, isochron. We can layer on a, a detailed map of, say, jobs and say, okay, within that blue band, there are 124,500 jobs. Uh, and you can see how that would vary looking at different travel time percentiles or time jobs. We can then take this calculation and repeat it for every single origin, every single block, every single parcel, every single 250 meter by 250 meter grid cell in the region and say, what does that access number look like? Like, what does that 124,565 number look like for everywhere in the region? And here's how that map would look. Um, the places in darkest blue have the access to the most jobs, and then going down from there, you know, Chicago, you know that the loop has a dense concentration of jobs, uh, and the L provides access to it, so you can kind of see here the outline of the transit map. As a quick aside here on the amount of computation going into this, we're talking about on the order of 5 million origins times 5 million destinations uh, times 60 different departure minutes, right? We calculate this at 7.30, 7.31, 7.32, all the way up to 8. So that yields something like uh, on the order of 10 to the 15th travel time calculations that we're doing to, uh, to actually generate this map. So there's a lot of computation that goes into this. We run this in a uh, pretty big computing cluster. So thanks, Amazon Web Services. For that. Uh, question. Actually, I was just going to ask about that. Mm -hmm. Is that something you store densely, or is it something that you compute on the fly for a given destination for all of your possible origins? Or are you using some other sort of heuristic to do this or how, how does it work? I'm curious. So we basically calculate the number once for each origin. When you do the origin search, you get it to all destinations. Okay. And then you reduce that number to a single number per origin. Yeah. So the storage here is only storage for the you know five million origins. Okay. So storage at the end of it. So okay, so you're talking about like a couple megabytes, not like a cert, not like a server rack worth of uh, data storage. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So uh, in computation terms, this is an embarrassingly parallel problem, right? Each origin yes. is independent. Um, and when we're only storing the accessibility numbers, it's a very small storage requirement at the end. Now, we do also have ways to store the many to many travel times, which gets very big for a number like this, uh, or the many to many paths, like the actual detailed transit itineraries people would take. We couldn't quite do it at this scale, but we can do it in at pretty large scale, so we have some efficient storage formats for that. Another question. Uh, what is the aggregate level of the data? I know the raw data for to fit there is a block level, and then it's assuming that using the centroids of the block group, uh, blocks to calculate the distance and their time. If, um, do, do you uh, aggregate that data over a larger scale? It's a great question. So. The baseline of the analysis here happens on a 250 meter by 250 meter grid. Actually, no, in this case, it was on a like 100 meter by 100 meter grid. Um, so basically, we take block level data, disaggregate it into like say a block. We would evenly distribute the evenly distribute the population in a block to the constituent 100 meter grid cells, uh, and then compute numbers for each of those grid cells. So you could aggregate up from these results to whatever you wanted to. And if these are 100 meter by 100 meter, you could aggregate up to parcels or blocks or whatever. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yep. So this is looking at kind of baseline conditions in Chicago. Now let's look like let's look at building an actual project, right? So the red line extension has been put in for federal funding in Chicago. How far could you get from this origin in the far south side of Chicago with the red line extension built? 
Well, in the baseline case, you can see the numbers in blue there. And then with the red line extension here, kind of extending the red line south to I think, four new stations, um, you can see the higher numbers in red there. So you can see not only how much farther can you get in kind of a network view, but also what other opportunities are within that expanded threshold of access. So this is, an, I think, an important way of looking at things. You're not only looking at access to the station. Like, yes, people will have easier access to a station, but ultimately this project is about getting them not just to the station, but to their final destination, to the opportunities at the other end of the line. And that's what this kind of analysis shows. So again, you can rerun this calculation for every point in the region and say not what is the number of jobs, jobs reachable, but what is the change in number of jobs reachable. And here you can see that map now in darkest blue, we're seeing the delta of up to 500,000, 565,000 additional jobs reachable within a 45 minute view. And you could test this out for different numbers. Um, you could say for uh, a different travel time percentiles or different time cutoffs, here's what it looked like for a 60 minute view. So as you move that travel time threshold up, you see that area of influence in terms of change in access going to expand effort. Yep. These are you these are jobs that are now accessible just because of the improved access from public transit, right? Not because employers have not chosen to move there because of the new public transit, but just mm -hmm. what was already there, right? Exactly. So there are, there's important limitations here. We're not looking at anything on the demand side. We're not looking at any feedback loops in terms of, you know, congestion. Uh, you know, this assumes you're able to board one of those trains, but maybe those trains get so crowded you can't board them. The first train that comes, you have to wait for the second. Uh, and it does not look at any feedbacks in the longer term land use transport system, which we know will occur. Um, so this is just looking at a kind of heteros part of this, all things equal. What happens if we open this tomorrow? How many more things could you get to? Also, is there a particular reason why the intervals are listed in reverse order? Like the bigger number before the smaller number? Uh, just the way it's listed, the order. Yeah, no okay. particular reason. Nothing, nothing else. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I wanted to know how often does it get updated in terms of jobs, school, like all the positions, and like where do you get that data from? Yeah, so this is kind of built as a flexible calculator and bring whatever data you want from it, um, whatever you want to it. The in this analysis, we used the loads jobs data, which are updated every year. Um, they, I think the CTA puts out new GTFS transit schedules every two or three months. Um, the road network probably isn't changing much, but you could update it as needed. I think this is an important question as people think about performance tracking over the longer term. Um, and maybe we can get to a, a discussion on that later. Um, whenever there are like multiple transit operators, like the one region, um, is it able to like account for transfers between like the potential line and the CTA line? Yep, yep. Um, so I think in uh, we've run this in Southern California, where there are, I think in that region, we have 96, like broadly Southern California, we've run it for like 96 different uh, transit feeds. Yep. All right, so this, this is just giving you an overview of what I think kind of the state of the practice is in terms of these access calculations. Now let's move into what I think could be some cool extensions to get at dimensions beyond just this basic travel time. So first I want to talk about cycling. Uh, as just an introduction, uh, can anyone do, give us a quick explanation of level of traffic stress? Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> one, one man's idea of creating a simple tool to rank roads on a one to four scale, suggesting one is good enough for anyone and four comfortable enough for pretty much no one except for, you know, hardcore cyclists. Excellent. Thank you. Super, super great for planning and communication. Uh, lots of questions about <laughs> scientific validity. <laughs> I think Based that's on a, his own impressions of having lived in the Netherlands, basically. Yeah. I, I think that is a great summary of it. So <laughs> just as a, you know, it can be a useful kind of sketch exercise to say one is uh, 
safe and comfortable for most people to bike around for is not. Now, it's one person's idea. Other people might have other ideas. Let me come back to that. But let's just take it as a, as a given for now. Um, so here's an analysis from where we are now of how many retail jobs you can get to within a 20-minute bike ride. In red, you can see how far you could get using all links of the LTS4. So if you're comfortable cycling anywhere it's legal, you can get to the areas shown in red. In blue, so where they overlap, it's purple, uh, is how far you could get if you're only comfortable using those safe cycling links, right? And so that's a smaller area. You can see the impact in terms of jobs, right? You're, you're, you lose about 150 retail jobs accessible. So we use retail jobs here as a proxy for like neighborhood retail, stores, things to get to, right? So from, from here, we're losing on the order of uh, whatever, 20%, 20% of our, our access to retail jobs. Um, not bad, Davis has pretty good cycling infrastructure. So let's go over to uh, Sacramento. And again, you can see the difference here in the difference between the blue line and the red line, right? So here, uh, same number of jobs reachable in the low stress network, but more than double the number of jobs from the previous scenario, so more than like three or four times the number of jobs reachable. So here, there's a bigger loss of access because of lack of safe cycling infrastructure, right? Um, we could do the same thing. We could try another origin, like in West Sacramento, there's an even bigger gap, right? So going from, if you can't see the numbers in the back, 129 retail jobs reachable with safe cycling versus 2,500 reachable uh, if you're a daredevil cyclist. What's, what's the speed of the cyclist? So we're assuming here, I think some default of like 15 kilometers per hour. It's a pretty fast assumed speed, but that's adjustable. I noticed that in this graph, as well as the one for Davis, there are significant sections of uh, some of the lines, at least, that are linear. But that's a long scale on the vertical axis, which is suggesting that there's essentially an exponential dependence of the number of jobs on your uh, travel time uh, setting. That uh, seems very surprising. Uh, so it's like, but it's it's a square term, right? So I think we, we use a square root axis here just because like- Oh, it's, cycle, it's not actually a it's log. It's not actually a log. Oh, that is confused. <laughs> uh, but but let, me, let me point out a couple of things on this graph. First, thanks for mentioning the flat line there on the blue. That's because you're basically like, you're in an island in the US in terms of- Right, right. right. Um, you, whereas like, if you're comfortable, I think it's like, um, Levy Levy Road will give you a connection to like the bike or sidewalk along the causeway or something. Mm -hmm. You could do it, but it's going to be kind of a stressful connection. So you can see, like, you can actually get off of the island if you're at LTS four, right? The red line continues going up, the blue line stays flat. Let me mention one other thing on these graphs. Um, you can see they kind of jump up at certain places, right? So like here, maybe at eighty or ninety minute, uh, eighty. 85 minutes, you can see the blue line kind of jumping up. Go back here, you can see kind of bumps in these lines, right? And this is something we might want to smooth out, right? Like if you're 21 minutes away from a big job cluster, you don't really want to say, oh, that counts for nothing. So one thing we can do is we can use a smoothing function or a decay function to say, okay, maybe if it's 20 minutes away, it's worth 50%. If it's 21 minutes away, it's worth 48%. You could kind of smooth that using a decay function, and that's what we show here. So in this case, the, the isochrones, the, the reachable areas on the map don't change. We're just changing how we weight each of those, each of the dots. Um, so we're saying even if it's 90 minutes away, it still counts for a tiny fraction of something, uh, but it's just not as good. So you can see here, that's why the numbers go up by, say, a factor of three or four. So again, we can re repeat this for every uh, origin in the region. Any guesses if we were to run just the basic 20 minute cutoff? So, like the number of jobs reachable in a 20 minute bike ride using only LTS 1 links versus using all links, where would you see the biggest difference between those two numbers in the Davis Sacramento region? Any guesses? Can you repeat the question? So, we're looking at access to retail jobs. 
We're going to calculate it once for a 20 minute bike ride using only safe, comfortable cycling and calculate it again for cycling anywhere it's legal and take the difference there. Where would that, where in the region would that difference be the largest? West Sacramento, one guess. Okay. Dixon. Dixon. Roseville. Okay. Um, so. What's the region? Yeah. Yeah. So, what I mean, are you considering the Sacramento? Yeah, just like kind of in, in the Davis and small Sacramento region. We, we could do this in a much wider region. Um, <laughs> this is regularly analyzed uh, by Caltrans in a very, very large region like the whole state. Uh, and SACOG is also using this tool to analyze like, all the way to Lake Tahoe, but um, just like in the local neighborhood. So I heard West Sacramento, I heard Dixon. Uh, South Sac. South Sac. So here's the map. It's darkest red in the places where the access is the where the access drop is the biggest. And I think what's actually happening here, it's about 20 minutes away from the Arden Fair Mall, right? Because that's a huge cluster of retail jobs. And so you can see here when you're using that kind of simple 20 minute cutoff, um, it's it's very sensitive to where specific job clusters are. So we actually want to use that smoothing function, that decay function. And here's what it looks like when you use that smoothing function. So I think now a lot of the places people mentioned show up, right? So West Sacramento uh, and a few other places. I think if we were to zoom out, we would see Roseville show up as well. Sorry, could you move back to the uh, previous one? I, yep. I, okay, okay. Sorry, I, I didn't get a good sense of how it changed. So yeah, I should have put these in some sort of animation or something, but now, so this is just looking at access to jobs in retail, again, as a proxy for like being able to get to local shops. We could do this for jobs in healthcare as a proxy for access to health services. We could do this access to all jobs. And I'll, I'll cycle through what those graphs look like in a minute. And I think what you wanna look for are places that show up as having a, as showing up in dark red across these graphs, right? Those are gonna be places from which um, lack of safe cycling infrastructure could be constraining people's ability to access jobs and other opportunities, right? So here's, here they are stepping through those three different types of jobs or two different types of jobs and then all jobs. And you can see again, kind of certain places showing up in all three of them. So there's a big question on like how you weight these different things, right? Like access to healthcare is for something, access to retail jobs is for something, access to grocery stores is probably another thing. Again, this is an area for future research. I would love the best minds in the room going to work on this. Like how do we come up with a single metric that weights all of these things? And if you're interested in more, come to the workshop we're doing at the TRB <laughs> conference on Sunday. So. Um, LTS has its limitations. Uh, I totally agree. Uh, this is why we've built into the platform a way to use either custom LTS or just throw LTS out the door and use custom impedance values, right? So on the first option there, uh, I should mention our, our documentation is fully open so you can go check out the user manual and, you know, go learn how to use any of this open source software. Um, but here we can load up kind of custom data layers. So the city of LA did a really cool community driven process where they said, okay, like these ideas of LTS, like we don't trust them. Let's like actually ask people in the community what they think feels safe and comfortable. So they, this, they did this whole project called stress-free neighborhood streets. And they came up with like the city of LA's way to classify streets on a scale of one to four. So you can load their custom, what they call LTS, but it's not actually the LTS. You could load their custom LTS into the platform and use that for the route. Alternatively, you could come up with your own impedance values to say, okay, you know, traversing a, a street link like this is 50% as hard versus 80% as hard. You could use a continuous kind of uh, uh, impedance values to do this routing. And that's something available as well. In the interest of time, we'll get into the details there. Just a couple quick ideas for future research along the LTS lines. One, it's really tough to figure out how to handle intersections in a routing setup that is based on links and nodes, because the nodes by definition are just connectors. They don't have a cost to traverse. So we need, we need to figure out a way to, um, you know, 
LTS at intersections, intersections and crossings are often the most stressful place, right? So we need to figure out a way to get the routing engine to think about that. Uh, any ideas there would be super welcome in, in discussion later. Uh, and then I'd also love to see a way to like scale this to classify intersections based on urban imagery or something. Um, so that it doesn't take like a bunch of detailed time, out, outreach time. So I'm running a little bit behind schedule, which is a perfect segue for my next topic <laughs> on transit, which often runs behind schedule. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about schedule variability and reliability. Um, just a few things to cover before I get into this. GTFS, the generalized transit feed specification, basically the way transit networks publish their schedules. So we can use that for all sorts of cool analyses. ABL, automatic vehicle location. We can store the positions of where the buses were at say five second intervals in some places and use that to do analysis. And then ODX is a system that has been built out at a number of transit agencies by the MIT Transit Lab to basically take archived ABL data, pair it with people's um, smart card, their transit fare card transactions, and reconstruct the journeys that people took, even if they're not actually tapping off the buses, right? So we can kind of look at these three things. These we can use these three different things to kind of get a sense of how people could travel or did travel or might not travel. So first case study here, just on scheduled waiting times. Uh, this was an analysis. Uh, came out last year in the Environment and Planning B. I worked on it with my colleague Andrew Bird. We looked at Santiago de Chile, which is very interesting. They don't publish bus schedules, or at least they didn't when we ran this analysis. They just say, all right, this line uh, runs every 20 minutes, this line in the same quarter runs every 30 minutes, but who knows if they're coordinated or not. So that even assuming that everything operates according to schedule, that can lead to a ton of variability and the travel tax people might experience day to day, right? So we have a pretty cool method to account for this. Uh, it's a Monte Carlo method that simulates different uh, potential travel times. The details of that are in this paper by Matt Conway, Matt Conway de now, who's a professor at UNC Chapel Hill, Andrew Bird, and Michael von Eggermann. Um, we basically said, okay, from a specific origin, say downtown Santiago, how far can you get in uh, 60 minutes or 30 minutes or 60 minutes at the different travel time percentiles, right? So assuming people just make the bus, just miss the bus, etc. Uh, and how does that vary as we run different simulations? So we could run a Monte Carlo simulation with a hundred different potential bus schedules. Or we could run that same Monte Carlo simulation with a thousand different potential bus schedules. What you're seeing here is how those travel time isochrones vary across multiple trials of that uh, using a small number of Monte Carlo draws. I think it was uh, 60 here on the left versus 1,200 here on the right. And you can see as you run more trials, basically the isochrones convert, right? So take just this pink one. If you're only running 60 simulated schedules, depending on which schedules you choose, this is bouncing around quite a bit, whereas it tends to converge a lot more here. Uh, so I'm not gonna have time to get into the details here, but it's important to account for the different frequencies of service. There's often a simplifying assumption made about kind of half the half headway assumption. Turns out if you use that assumption, you can miss a lot of important details. Um, and in particular, it's not a spatially uniform difference, right? So making this assumption means that you could be significantly underestimating, underestimating the benefits of transit in certain places. Um, so yeah, sorry, I don't have time to get into that, but there, the paper is available and I'd love to chat more with folks who are interested in the nitty, deta nitty gritty details of transit service. So the next thing I'm gonna look at, everything I showed in that past case study, was assuming that things operated according to the plan. Even if the plan doesn't say exactly when the buses leaves, it assumes they run on time. In this analysis, uh, we're relaxing that assumption. So we're saying, okay, what happened in the MBTA last week or two weeks ago? What happened over the course of multiple weekdays? 
in red, you can see here how far someone could get from that specific origin according to the MBTA schedules, the MBTA, the transit provider in Boston. And in blue, so in purple where they overlap, you can see how far they could get according to how the buses and trains actually ran over the course of 10 work days. What do you see here? Well, the blue tends to be much smaller than the red. So you can't get as far as the schedules promise. Uh, and that has an impact in terms of the number of jobs you can reach. And some specific days, you know, maybe there was a train breakdown and the buses were super bunched. You could only access maybe 60% of the jobs you should be able to access. So uh, that's one way of kind of looking at, uh, you know, the travel times people actually experience and starting to get at reliability. Uh, we also did a study with some transit lab colleagues in Chicago, looking at not just GTFS, the schedules, versus ABL, where the buses actually were, but where people actually went or where we think they went using ODX. I won't get into the methodological details, but here's the takeaway. In green, you can see here the distribution of travel times for a large number of OD trips according to the schedule. Blue, you can see how far people could get if they were riding the buses in the, op in the optimal way, given how the buses actually ran on a given day. And in pink, you can see where how long their trips took based on ODX. Question. Yeah, so I'm curious if there had, because I think in the previous slide, the sort of animated map of the red and blue area was showing that the blue is always a strict subset of the red, I think. There uh, are a couple places where the express buses on the mass pike actually get you farther than the schedule suggests. But generally, yes. Yeah, so yeah and I, I was actually kind of war wondering about that and if there were instances, for instance, where like the schedule was act, the schedule for different buses was such that people would need to transfer, say, from bus A to bus B to be able to get from one place to another for uh, the most part. And there are very few transfers that would happen from bus B to bus A at that time. And but like the schedule had just been badly planned and was originally planned for people to go from B to A. And it just so happened that one day um, bus A came before bus B. So the A to B transfer was facilitated and you got more of that uh, happening and there were more jobs access than the uh, schedule would suggest, did you ever observe anything like that? Uh, there can be, uh, there, we have observed some counterintuitive effects of the interactions between certain schedules. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, so in this case, basically the takeaway here was that for this analysis in Chicago, it took people almost 14 minutes longer to get where they were supposed to be going. Than, than what we think it should have taken. Now we can decompose that a little bit, say how much of that is the fault of the buses and how much of that is people choosing to do things that may be making their trips long. Uh, it turns out most of it is people choosing to do different things. It's, it, only a little bit of it can be attributed to unreliability in the system. Now, why might people choose to take trips that are longer than we think are necessary? It could be that they have a daycare drop-off to do. It could be that they don't feel safe using a certain station. It could be that a certain station is not accessible to them. Um, so there could be all different reasons there. And I think it's an interesting area of future research to like actually ask people for making those longer trips, why they're doing that, what barriers might they be facing. Yep. It seems like you applied this to different cities other than Chicago, but at least I felt like that. So I was wondering where you uh, found the difference between relatively less dense cities as compared to Chicago in terms of the mismatch between AVL versus DTFS or OPX versus DTFS. That's a great question. We have, I have not actually, and this this was work in collaboration with a couple of students, Ting Lee, Patrick Meredith from Kui uh, Fong, who was a postdoc in our lab, and then a few other people. Um, we just ran this in Chicago. It would be an interesting thing to run in other places. I have not been a part of any of those other studies, 
I know that uh, Nate Wessel, and who was uh, a doctoral student with Stephen Farber at the University of Toronto, did something very similar, looking at least at GTFS versus ABL in Toronto, and I think two other cities. Um, Renato Arbex, uh, who works uh, in Sao Paulo in Brazil, has also done a very similar study. Um, so yeah, uh, and uh, I'll also mention Tierra Bills at UCLA, who's done something conceptually similar at a paper, I think, in the transportation research record a couple years ago on uh, kind of people's adaptations to unreliability. Yep. Yeah, I was curious when you mentioned people might stop for different reasons. So how do you determine the origin and destination versus the mid stops as not official or as valuable destinations? Yeah, so it, it comes down to making certain assumptions about what is a transfer versus what is like an actual trip. It comes down to certain assumptions about distances and times involved. Um, let me, we did a case study on that in Washington, DC. Uh, this was work with uh, a Harvard undergraduate student, Daniela Schumann, postdoc in our lab, a lot of the uh, Ines Sanchez de Maravillaga, a professor in Spain and a few other people, um, where we looked at trying to actually infer where people were making grocery store stops and daycare dropout stops and school dropout stops. And it turns out you can kind of pick those out in the data, but it does take some careful attention. Uh, and in this analysis, we didn't get into investigating that. So uh, I was wondering if you're considering another version of this, including maybe the fair payment, because you said that one of, I think it's the OTX that it includes that, and also if you have a way to divide the, the data between different segments of the population? Mm. So yes, you could definitely do that and say like, you know, if we decompose this by bus and rail, for example, there are different fares there, but there are also different levels of reliability. That would be a, a great extension on this. Um, I have something on fares a little bit later, but we can include it in this analysis. In a very similar concept of distance to distribution, um, their study shows that distribution actually very sensitive to the skill of the unit used to do the calculation. Have you done this statistical analysis? Uh, we they haven't in this. All, but whatever the skill that could be. Yeah, we haven't in this case, but it could be um, interesting. We did this at a pretty disaggregate level. Um, basically looking at individual transit stops and then aggregating up to what I think we were using blocks. So, yeah. All right, um, let me just mention a couple other quick case studies. Um, one, I know there's a lot of interest in micro transit. This is something we've uh, built in as well. We have a case study on the Conveil blog about how to incorporate micro transit service. We looked at the LA Metro zones and basically ran and accessibility analysis under a bunch of different scenarios. So 2019 was scheduled service, and then they added the MOD pilot. 2020 had both the MOD pilot and the micro transit project. Uh, at a certain point, they opened those up to kind of door-to-door -door travel zones and then combined the MOD into the micro transit. And then we ran a scenario where we actually extended a couple of the zones. And so you can see here how the access to jobs evolves under those different scenarios. And you can see in particular some of the micro transit zones like around North Hollywood, for example, kind of popping out. Um, so just a couple of future research ideas here. Uh, this is the, from the paper I mentioned with Daniela Schumann and Colorado Bill We looked in the Washington DC area at where people might be taking daycare, school and grocery store stops along the way. We also, in that case, had a data set of the inferred gender of the cart of the transit user. Turns out women tended to be disproportionately making school drop-offs um, and doing grocery store trips as well. So we saw those patterns during weekdays, but not during weekends, for example, which gives us some sense that they are stops. I think there are some significant implications there in terms of gender equity, and that's where we'd love to kind of continue uh, that's where we'd like to continue. I also want to mention that the MTC in the Bay Area has some interesting stop arrivals data sets like the observed ABL that could be used to run a similar analysis to the one I described here uh, in California. And then there are some extensions around microtransit that I think would be pretty interesting to run as well. Um, 
when was this, uh, like, what year was this data from? I think this was 2019 data. Okay, because I'm curious if, like, what we've seen in terms of the sort of uh, smoothing of the previously bimodal uh, uh, commute uh, patterns would correlate at all to potentially uh, closing this gender gap mm. in terms of uh, midday care trips. That would be an interesting thing to look at. Uh, yeah, seeing, seeing how this evolves. Thanks for that idea. <laughs> all right, so that was the longest section. Let me just mention a few things on fares before wrapping up. Fares are pretty important. Um, it's a, another important dimension here of people's access. Uh, this was a study that Matt Conway Bagat and I did back in 2019, where we built full Pareto frontiers of transit journeys, uh, looking at both how long the trip would take and how much it would cost. So here's an example. These are isochrones again, how far you can get from that origin marker within 60 minutes. Uh, but now we're adding a bit, an additional constraint. So if you've only got $2 to spend, you can only get to that inner green isochrone within one hour. You've got $13 to spend, you can get all the way almost to Rhode Island within one hour, uh, but you're paying much more. So that's looking at the area reachable within 60 minutes. Here's the area reachable within two hours. Again, you can see that um, you can get farther out with only $2, but it's gonna take you two hours instead of one. Um, and you can also see here how this kind of uh, affects the different commuter rail lines. Commuter rail is the more expensive service. So you could look at any of these origin destinations. Can you yeah. share your formulas? <laughs> <laughs> um, can, like how to actually compute this? So this is this is all available open source uh, in the R5 uh, library. So yeah, if you look in R5, there is a uh, Boston in routing fare calculator that we basically coded for this analysis. Um, so yeah, that's all available online. And if anyone wants to extend that to other places, I'd love to collaborate. Um, <laughs> so for any of these origin destination pairs, you can build what we call this Pareto frontier, right? So this is a specific case going from Norwood here to Copley, you can pay zero dollars to do that trip if you walk all the way, right? It's going <laughs> to take you over three hours. Sorry, from where to where? Uh, from Norwood to Copley. Ah. So that's basically like running the Boston Marathon. Yeah, sorry, more than three hours, like 200 something minutes. That's like running the Boston Marathon. Um, if you, there are buses, you can do it only on buses, and you can do that for less than two dollars, but it's going to take you over an hour and a half. There are all these different options, and if you're riding commuter rail all the way, you can do it in under 45 minutes, but it's going to cost you over $7, right? So behind the scenes here, we can have this Pareto frontier. We actually build this Pareto frontier for every origin destination pair in the region. And then by doing that, you can avoid making assumptions about people's value of time and just say, like, here are all the options and not have to assume a priori, well, people will make this trade off or that. So that lets you do some pretty interesting analyses on fair policy. We had a scenario here uh, where we said certain, the commuter rail system in Boston has a zone-based fair system. And we said you take certain stations and you basically like make them the lower zone fair. So you take stations in zone two, make them equivalent to using stations in zone one. And just by changing that, not by changing any of the schedules or any of the service, you could have a pretty substantial impact in terms of people's access to jobs. This is the number of jobs reachable. I think this was in 60 minutes. Um, and you can see here, the increase in the number of jobs reachable with 60 minutes. And I think this was a uh, $5 fare limit by changing the fare policy, right? So those places that might've been too expensive to take commuter rail, once they drop below the $5 limit, all of a sudden you get much more job access. Uh, Matt, Matt Conway Bagat and I did a similar analysis for transit center looking at the New York region, where you basically said, okay, if you integrate fares between Long Island Railroad, Metro North, and uh, New York City Transit, here's how many more jobs people could get to with certain budget, with a 275 budget. Why is there any particular, like if you go back to your uh, previous slide from mm -hmm. Boston, there's a fair amount of 
colorful uh, uh, area around Somerville and around, you know, Boston, just south of that and something like that. Why is there any change there in the first place if there are already places that you could get to in a one hour limit and a five dollar budget? I think those may actually be picking up on a reverse commute, like riding commuter rail out to some of the more Ah, things. okay. Yeah, great, great question. Um, so yeah, we did this analysis similarly for the New York region, um, looking at like a change. If you combine, so in this case, we looked only at a change in fare policy, integrating fares, but if you combine that with more frequent service, uh, you could see even additional benefits. So a lot you can do here in terms of fares. I think this still raises the question, are we trying to improve access for places or are we trying to improve access for people? Um, and this, this is, I think, where the accessibility thinking starts to run into some conceptual boundaries, right? What we're actually concerned with is helping people access opportunities. And if we're just doing it, yes, in some ways, place is a good proxy for who lives there, but there may be arguments for making things a little bit more person focused. Uh, Laurel Paget Seagans, who worked for a while, uh, Dr. Watkins, and then also with the MBTA uh, as their assistant general manager for policy, um, has done some really thought provoking writing on this and saying, you know, yes, this accessibility stuff can be helpful, but maybe we want a bit more of a targeted or nuanced approach. So we'll leave that as some food for thought. Uh, yeah, just I would love to get in touch if anyone's interested in working on these fairs uh, stuff, especially for this the San Francisco Bay Area. There is now a GTFS fairs extension. So in theory, these data are available in a standard format. It'd be pretty cool to use that rather than doing kind of the ad hoc approach we use. And just generally, I think there's a lot more work that could be done on these kind of individual level constraints. So last section. Uh, I, I think. Let me just say the big question here is how do we actually measure what matters when we look at accessibility measurements? I've talked about computing some new dimensions that I think could matter, but I think there's a lot more work to be done here. Um, and I think there's particularly some interesting work to be done in equity analysis and getting at people, people's kind of lived experience and lived expertise. So let me just go back to this map that I opened with, looking at the increase in jobs people might experience with the red line extension in Chicago, right? And now this feels like it might be missing quite a few things, right? We're only looking at people's scheduled travel times. We're not looking at how reliable those trips are. We're not looking at individual safety concerns they might have or other barriers to tra transit. We're not looking at caretaking trips or other things that they may need to do along the way. So all of a sudden it feels like, yes, this is a helpful metric, but there's a lot more we could add to it. I think there are some exciting opportunities in terms of research to actually be adding these things. Um, one particular highlight is that the US government, the federal government is very interested in this. The FTA a couple of years ago put out a, a request for information on the Title VI process. A number of transit agencies, civic groups, other people responded to this saying, yes, we want to measure access to opportunities. So people are asking to do this type of thing and asking to take into account uh, inclusive approaches and some of some more piece, uh, things on look expertise. This was transit center's response to this. You can see in big letters, measure access to destinations, clearly a priority. Jarrett Walker saying the same thing. Um, yeah, so I, I think there's a lot of momentum for not only adopting these metrics as they've been formulated, but also improving them. So let me just end on a perspective. Uh, this was from a great paper by Kate Lowe, Jesus Barajas, and Chelsea Corin that came out actually talking to people in Chicago about the barriers they faced to transit. And they really tried to critique access measures and say, we need to incorporate people's lived expertise. Um, so I'm excited this summer, we actually have a project uh, between the MIT Transit Lab and Professor Kate Lowe at University of Illinois in Chicago, actually going to 95th Street Station in Chicago and talking to riders and asking them We've, we've got a great team of ethnographers on this to kind of get at what barriers people might be facing. And hopefully um, through that kind of interview process and the qualitative data analysis we hope to do, we can start really enriching some of these calculations that, that I've shown so far. 
and, and ultimately, you know, not just enrich the calculations, but actually meaningfully improve people's access to, to opportunities. So thank you very much. I hope it's uh, not been too long and boring, um, but happy end of the quarter. And if you're interested in collaborating on any of these topics uh, or any other ones, please, please let me know, get in touch. Thank you very much. A different vibe today. They interrupted in the middle of it. I'm <laughs> guessing there are still more questions to be had out there. So. Uh, can you remind me of the definition of like a uh, safe bike infrastructure in the calculation of travel time at the beginning of the section? Yeah, so what it, the analysis I showed was a super, super naive definition of that basically based on the lowest common denominator of available tags in OpenStreetMap. It was not actual LTS definitions. Uh, it was kind of a proxy for LTS. Uh, if, uh, it's kind of a long string of conditionals. Again, it's, it's in the code, but basically it's um, kind of assuming certain things that things are tagged in OpenStreetMap as arterials versus residential streets, et cetera. So the classification of bike ways in OSI was incorporated to indicate safe or not. Exactly. Yeah. So if something's tagged as a bikeway, we assume it's safe, but if it's on the street, then it depends on the type of street. Uh, there, there, it's kind of a long thing, thing of branching yeah, conditional. Yeah, but I, I should mention that you know we're working locally to incorporate some better data sets, right? So we have this tool to kind of say, well, if say SACOG has a better estimation of what LTS should be on streets, we can load in their data set, use those LTS classifications instead. So what I showed was just kind of illustrative example, but there are probably better ways of doing it. Yep. Uh, yes, so, so, does, so does R5 have a way of, of incorporating like say SACOG model? So, so actually, I've actually doing like a little research because like I'm trying to figure out like how do we optimize some of these like bus routes because I didn't I didn't know you were doing this kind of research but one of the things that I stumbled upon when I was like just get up just looking around SACOM has their own model of I think it was their 2030 uh the 2030 vision could you probably extend R5 to include that kind of their own model into the so like using act their activity sim based model um no, I mean, you have to look at the GitHub, but I think this is like their um, 2030, I'm forgetting which platform. Oh, 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 like, like um, incorporating future year projects into the network? Uh, I mean, well, it's, the, it's their own model, right? So their own model into this, like sort of joining what, the, like their own projections of how land use and population densities and all that will and emerge that into this model. Yes. You have job density and you have population. Yes, so so on the land use side, using the land use projections. Yeah, land use model. jobs. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, that is work we are doing. Yeah. So part of the accessibility that you showed us, it seems that it's like the average travel time from the different blocks that you can by one hundred, like one hundred times one hundred, right? So does this is is this all based on like the maybe the travel time surveys or you know like but it's mostly average right can you change that for like in the in the platform can you like maybe specify by income level and race ethnicity gender can you filter and change that dynamic to, so that not, you're not getting the average but maybe you're getting more specific so that's that is a really really good question we are not doing it based on reported travel times where you uh, I should have mentioned, like behind all the scenes and all of this, R5 is basically solving a big shortest path algorithm. So it's saying like, okay, this is how far someone should be able to get, assuming they walk at this speed to access transit, assuming transit's on schedule, assuming they can take these modes. Um, you could change those parameters to say like, okay, we want to look at someone who doesn't take the more expensive rail modes, or we could look at someone who walks more slowly or someone who's only willing to walk five minutes instead of 20 minutes to a stop. So you could change all those parameters and maybe use different personas of different travelers to kind of get at that and kind of model that. Um, 
but it's there isn't like a a slider to say like what was the actual travel time distribution. It when we're doing kind of the the core accessibility analysis. Longer term, I think I think you're asking exactly the right thing. Like how do we take people's actual experienced travel times and the full distribution of those experienced travel times and kind of build them into a tool like this. Um, that's that I think would be amazing to do. It it would require kind of a level of data that I haven't really worked with yet. Like I think the advantage of this is you can do it for you know such detailed locations, but if you're basing it on survey data, you're gonna have a much sparser set of covered origins. Uh, for one of the earlier slides that you had showed about the uh, and discussed about the uh, different isochrons for different uh, LTS for bytes, do you have a, a paper to uh, like citation to associated with that? Uh, there are a couple of blog posts on it. Uh, okay. But not an academic paper. Okay. Yeah. First of all, thanks so much for a really interesting talk. Um, learned a lot. And I have this big question, which may be a hard question, but I'm just curious your thoughts. A lot of the things. So picking destinations is a challenge. Like, what do you pick for destinations? It seems like you were using modes data, categorizing modes data as proxies for destinations. Um, but I'm really curious about the O side because we tend to just think of residences and our O's, but so much of the travel we do are not from our home. So I'm curious what you recommend for categorizing, say, a whole city. Um, accessibility measures when you don't just use homes as your O's, but you use other destinations. What are your thoughts there? Um, yeah, I think that's a, a hugely important question. Trip chaining more generally, right? Yeah. Like, sure, like what actually drives most of my day to day decision making, or not day to day, but like one of my biggest constraints in terms of commuting might be what daycares are in reach of my job, right? Yeah. Like that might drive my job location choice, that might drive my residential location choice. Like, and so yeah, I totally agree looking at different O's, you know, different origins would be really important. In terms of doing that systematically to come up with some sort of consolidated indicator for a city, that's a, that's a tough question. So you've never, so no, you don't know anyone who's ever done that, done anything other than Residences as as O's. I mean, you you can definitely run it. You can run like jobs and their access to employees. You could do, you know, some sort of chaining and say like analyze access to this set of things from this set of origins. I can use like say groceries. Maybe to come up with some sort of like overall trip chaining thing, you could say like look at how many residents are within access of grocery stores, and then to add that up to how many grocery stores are within access to jobs, and then you know, kind of reconstruct different trip chains. I don't know of anyone who's done that in a satisfying way. Um, and on the choosing destination side, I, Henry, do you want to say anything about that? I know you presented on that last quarter in the seminar. But, uh, yeah, I would just say it's really subjective and sometimes fraught. Um, I mean, like our approach statewide has been pretty different. I think what Nancy has presented and that we're pretty limited to like doing things at a statewide scale. Where if you're focused on like the Sacramento metropolitan region, you just have a lot more customized local data sources. Um, generally, you mean like like private like, like POI data? Yeah, so like we use for, for our statewide stuff, we use points of interest data that we got from here that we did some high level kind of cleaning out. We've been like replacing some of those things with open source points where we can find them for like hospitals and grocery stores, so that we can not rely on um, proprietary data. Um, but generally, I mean, we, we were both part of a TAC that Caltrans and the uh, Minnesota Department of Transportation ran on kind of doing accessibility analysis in practice, especially at the DOT level. Um, and the only consensus we got on non work destination stuff was that it's really subjective and that, um, <laughs> like, there's a bunch of different ways you can lay it, which we're doing. Um, and that there, there is some interesting research, I think, coming out about doing that um, in Massachusetts. Um, from Liz Williams' team, which we'll look forward to seeing. Um, but there's also I, I would, one other sort of approach to there's this objective, just kind of waiting it, however, appro 
approach based on those sort of policy goals, for example, you know, grocery stores, hospitals, maybe, uh, versus if you're trying to be predictive with accessibility or um, I know, match observed travel behavior, then you can use like NHTS survey data um, to kind of maybe roughly approximate how much to weight some of these destination maps. Yeah, I mentioned that here too, because so much for I feel like as transportation is improved for trains that we've been paying. That's what we've done under the dam. And yet yeah, look where we've gotten like thinking of supply and demand. It's just a disaster now, right? Um, so then yet again, again now we're thinking of like we have all these great supply tools and we're trying to we're thinking about incorporating demand. But then again, the whole point is to use these tools to supply something different to change demand, right? So part of me thinks I'm wary of like moving back in that direction. I mean, I do want them to be realistic measures, but I also think I think stepping backwards to say, oh, we have these great accessibility measures, and now we want to go see how predictive of demand they are. You know what I mean? Maybe it's maybe it's a cyclical thing, but I just I would add on to the idea of using something other than employment as your destination seems more critical as we enter this time of like more work from home and all these agencies are coming to us just freaked out because they're trying to draw in riders that are not necessarily the people who are commuting. I mean, BART, you know, Capital Corridor, like this is what they're trying to do. And so I almost wonder if you could do something based with population on both ends, like you're yeah. going to see sort of people in your life and things like that and trying to use transit to do those trips. That's a great idea. Um, there was some research that came out in Australia um, and I think they kind of called it effective social density, which okay. was a fancy way of saying like people's access to people. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I think there is actually a pretty strong argument for looking at just like how many other people can you yeah. get to within a certain mm -hmm. amount of time. Um, this came up in working with the city of LA, one of their concerns was kind of the informal economy and also just a lot of caretaking tasks mm -hmm. that might not, you know, people caring, doing childcare or elder care whose jobs, you know, whose, whose, they may be very real jobs, but they are not reflected in the loads administrative data, right? So there's, I think, a strong argument for using just people's access to the, the overall population. Just piggybacking on Carrie's point to point out that, like, with the thing I was mentioning earlier too about work from home and sort of flattening out that uh, the final peak in the uh, commute volume in the time of day, we've also seen that sort of an overall rise in the BMT that might be coming from, in part, less trip chaining because people feel more free to make more trips from home to errand back to home mm -hmm. instead of going home to work and then work to errand to errand to errand and then back home yeah so that could be a factor too or, or doing those all like from my home there are, i have a preferred mark i have a preferred grocery store market basket yes uh, and there are two locations there's one kind of that i can chain on the way from work if i'm doing a transit commute or there's one farther out in the suburbs that would, would be driven to and if I'm not going into work, then doing it as part of the trip chain doesn't make as much sense. So that, that could be generating the MT. Yeah, it's good, good idea. Uh, well, thank you for your presentation and work. And you know, now you're coinciding that it can, this is a great model that can be used like, for segments of people for a specific policy. Right? You study people in a region, um, maybe disadvantaged communities, or maybe elders, uh, then you can find enough detail to come up with a program that fits. And on that, I think, I think there's, it's exciting to do work on, on the assumptions. Just, it, um, I find that the speed you assign for biking is also the Google algorithm. But it's way too fast. Exactly. Like, I don't yeah. know, I thought it was me. Like, oh, <laughs> and I'm, you know, like, most females will find it too fast. Right. Um, so it's usually gendered and other kinds of biases yeah. that we uh, we're maintaining the status quo of, you know, male based assumptions in big data in policy 
right? So it's an invitation to join. <laughs> no, but like, um, yeah, thank you for being open and be, making it open, open source and discussing that, you can like revise like the destinations. I, from Professor Barajas, we just learned, I was biased myself, like in the US must be 60% destination jobs. Right? Mm. It's 18%. Yeah, yeah. Right, so it's- Predominantly. It's kind of ridiculous, it's not even representative of the majority of the trips. And we're focusing still on that. So that yeah, was just a comment, not a question. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, so we have LPS for cycling trips. Um, do we have anything that could be used to measure pedestrian trips um, based on sidewalk conditions, especially uh, pedestrians with some kind of disability? Uh, do we have the, the data to construct anything like that? I'm really glad you asked that. Let me respond along two lines. So first, um, we have built in a number of ways. My general take is that oftentimes the more continuous, like custom impedance value approach is better than this like one through four classification. Um, it's a little harder to communicate and get across. To me, as a researcher, it's more methodologically satisfying. So. Um, the most work we've done on this has been with the city of LA um, who wanted to make their own custom impedance factors for walking. And they in particular were interested in uh, tree canopy and shape uh, along walking routes. And so we loaded in a really cool data set from the forest service on urban tree canopy and basically projected that over the sidewalks and then gave sidewalks a discount if they were pleasant and shaded to walk on. Nice. <laughs> If any of you have followed the news uh, out of LADOT over the last couple of weeks, you'll, you'll know that shade is a big issue for them. Um, but that's, that's an aside. Uh, the, the second thing you mentioned on kind of sidewalk conditions and like how that might be barriers for people using wheelchairs or other mobility devices, um, that is something that I think we have the methodological detail and like the routing power to handle. But it's a question of input data. Uh, so there's been some really exciting work getting underway in Washington State. Uh, Thomas Craig at the Washington State DOT has done an amazing job. The state legislature there asked, okay, we want to report on how many people have a 10 minute, have 10 minute access to uh, frequent transit service across the state. He's done an amazing job of translating that request into, well, to actually answer this question, we need to look at detailed sidewalk conditions. So the Tasker Center and I think others have um, come up with this open sidewalk specification and that's something we're looking into incorporating. So I think as those data become available, uh, we would be able to incorporate them. How those data get maintained over time is another question, but um, I, think, I think there is some hope there. Just along the same lines, like crime data, seems like something you would know, include for walking and biking and transit. Um, have you ever included impedances for <coughs> your uh, personal safety? Uh, no, but it's something we've thought about. The, the mechanism we use to build in kind of the sun exposure or shade layers uh, is a general purpose mechanism to basically take a raster layer of exposure to something could be elevation to look at slopes. We have a version built for that, uh, for kind of steep, avoiding steep hills. Uh, it could be sun. Um, and we'd love to use that same mechanism to load in layers on like transportation noise. There's a cool transport, national transportation noise map. And we could look at like, you know, walking near freeways is probably pretty unpleasant and should have a high impedance. We could use uh, that, with, that same mechanism with prime or other kind of exposure type data sources. I feel like some so for questions now um, on the, the, the sources for the information. Um, was it street light? I'm sorry, I missed that. Well, so, uh, like privacy issues that you were, that's probably uh, aggregated. You still got to, to, to gender. Is there any uh, privacy issues if you want to go deeper? How does that work? So, a couple of things. One, on the like out of the box, the R5 uses open street map data GT and GTFS uh, to build up a multimodal transportation network. 
the analysis I mentioned in DC was using their uh, fare card records. Uh, those with our transit lab partnership with the, the Washington Metro. And that was subject to very serious privacy controls. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, uh, this response. Well, so you said, I mean, I know this, but it's all based on OpenStreetMap, but the accuracy of OpenStreetMap varies greatly from community to community. So can you talk a little bit more about like, have you tried to come into some places that were interested in running the software and like the OpenStreetMap data was really not good enough to be able to do so? Yes. Yeah, that's definitely a concern. And even within a given region, there was an example we were looking at in like Minneapolis, St. Paul, where like certain parts of downtown have a very detailed sidewalk network drawn out and other parts don't. Um, and so to do kind of an apples to apples comparison, you know, needed to kind of draw in the baseline transit network. So yes, the, the data availability is, is an important question there. I think another clever thing that's being done in, in Washington state is basically saying like, the state should be putting resources into updating OpenStreetMap. Um, and that will become kind of a, a point of reference that they use. So I'm, it is it is an issue now, but I'm hopeful it'll improve over time. Just to follow up, you, when your involvement in the tab for Caltrans, did Caltrans talk about that? <laughs> 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 can I can I pass this one off? To you? Yeah, we're not as far ahead as Washington on this, but we've kind of also identified them as kind of the ideal state um, and the resources they're working on there. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something we've wanted to do. Um, so I, I think we'll be talking with kind of higher up um, people in our world about doing that. Maybe if you're like interested. Um, I've also talked a lot to our Caltrans like data people. Um, and we maintain all roads sort of GIS data right. that's an authoritative one. It, it doesn't have like op system biking head stuff, which is an issue, but um, that's it early. Does, it doesn't have local roads either. That does have local like roads, but um, off the state highway system. But we've had promising early discussions about hopefully long term because they get that data from counties when it comes up to the state. Yeah. Since we already have this mechanism in place to just put that out through map, like that would kind of make more sense, I think. So I think we're, we want to get to where Washington is going. Maybe one more, anybody else? All right, we can just end there and thank you. Did I miss somebody? Uh, I've got a question here. Uh, to further OSM in the local streets, because there's two different uh, data sources. Do you know, like, are there any research out there to the Apple Apple comparison and see how far the OSM data from the local data? Uh, I don't know. I, I'm sure there have been studies done. Um, I, I don't know of a, a, an authoritative one off the top of my head. Um, I mean, I will say OpenStreetMap has improved a ton over the last five or six years because Facebook, Apple and basically everyone who's not Google Maps has decided to put their resources into OpenStreetMap. So um, yeah, it, it has improved a lot because people like our Facebook is like paying people to edit OpenStreetMap. It has its ups and its downs, but uh, I think the data quality on it is improved. All right, let's thank you.